Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks a lot for everything. And as uh, as Lou mentioned, I'm a first year here. I'm here with my um, my wife and my two sons. And you guys probably saw me walk around the baby folds in yesterday. And I'm hoping to uh, wow you with more awesome kidness later on today. Uh, so today I'm going to talk to you guys about the New Testament. And when I think back to, I don't know, way too long ago, when I was in high school, like a little over a decade ago, and I think about my first experience with the Bible. It started with me watching this movie, The Exorcist. Has anyone ever seen that <laughs> scary, scary ass movie? Um, anyway, so um, at the conclusion of that movie, which is about, as you might guess, an exorcism, and it's a terrifying movie about the devil, uh, I got the urge to read the account of Jesus confronting the devil in the wilderness, out in the, out in the desert, you know, the temptations. And so I went upstairs, I got to my bookcase, I dusted off the Bible, I opened it up to the New Testament, because I knew that's where the Jesus stuff was, and promptly realized I had no idea where this story even was. It was like I was looking for a specific shop somewhere in, you know, the city of Las Vegas, and I just teleported myself to Las Vegas, and I'm like, Wait a minute, I don't know the first thing about Las Vegas. And so, you know, you can't find anything. And uh, so that was my experience of the New Testament back when I was in high school. And it was a bit like this. We got a lot of it in our heads, right? Because you hear, you hear the Bible during Mass. And that's one thing I didn't even realize, was that the stuff that they're reading at Mass is the Bible. Like, I, I had no idea. Um, it was like Paul's letter to the something-somethings. And I was like, who are they? Um, so a lot of it's in your head. So you can quote your like your ability to quote the Bible, or at least for a lot of people, is like, doesn't it say something in there about uh, this? And you're like, no, don't ask me to find it. Uh, thank God for Google, because with Google you can actually sort of like type in there. Doesn't the Bible say this? And it'll usually give you a few hints. Uh, but that's generally what the average person's knowledge of the Bible is. And that's definitely where I was. And the reason why I couldn't find the account of Jesus tempting in the wilderness in the, in the Bible was because I was ignorant of Scripture. And the thing is, though, it doesn't have to be that way. And in fact, it shouldn't be that way. In the Catechism of the Catholic Church, which if you don't know is the big book of stuff the Catholic Church teaches, it says the following. The Church forcefully and specifically exhorts all the Christian faithful to learn the surpassing knowledge of Jesus Christ by frequent readings of the divine scriptures. Ignorance of, of the scriptures is ignorance of Christ. Which is, you know, kind of startling language if you think about if you know the scriptures and you're like, I don't. Know. And then you're like, well, geez, according to the Catechism, that's ignorance of Christ. But there's actually a flip side to that, which is good news, because we oftentimes talk about how you need to have a personal relationship with Jesus. And a lot of people, especially if you're like me, you're like, how do you get one of those? Like, is there something I'm supposed to do to get this personal relationship thing, my Bob? Like, is there a prayer I'm supposed to have? Is it a voice in my head? Is like, is there some practical step I can do to make that first step to that personal relationship with Jesus? And the answer is, yes, the first step you can do is to read scripture. So a lot of people, you know, would love to read scripture, but, you know, if you're anything like me, I, no one ever sat me down and talked about what the heck it is or how to understand it. And the best way to understand it, the first thing you got to do is know where we got it, all right? Where did this New Testament thing about come from? Because as you pick it up, you know, it's just sort of like all these random things stapled together, you know, like, how? What, dude? Where did this come from? So let's go into that. The first thing you have to know when considering the origin of the New Testament is the historical fact of the ministry of Jesus Christ. So around the year 30 AD, Jesus, uh, you know, he, he got out, he started preaching and teaching and doing miracles and driving out demons and all kinds of cool stuff. Um, and when he was doing that, he picked 12 apostles and he gave them the promise and the authority that they were going to be the teachers and leaders of his new people of God. And then, as everybody knows, uh, Jesus was then, for our sake, crucified under Pontius Pilate, suffered death, and was buried. On the third day, he rose again from the, from the dead in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended to heaven, and now we see the right hand of the Father, from whence he shall come again to judge the living and the dead. Amen. That's where Jesus is at. But what did he leave behind? What was the, what was the thing that Jesus left behind so that the, his faithful could learn what the faith is? Well, he didn't mail down a Bible you know, from the clouds being held by angels wrapped in ribbon. Uh, no, he left uh, 12, actually 11 at that point, very confused fellas. 
And they went out into the world to go do what they were told to do, which was preach and teach and lead the people of God. And they gathered to themselves a small group of, uh, of close confidants like Luke and Philip and Mark and a couple other folks, Timothy and <coughs> Silas. And then there was also the very special calling of the Apostle Paul, who was knocked down on his road to Damascus and commissioned by God to be an apostle in kind of a very special way. And so these guys went out into the world, preaching and teaching and setting up Christian communities, and they would set up a, a Christian community, and then they would move on to the next place. And when they did that, they would set up someone, someone would be the pastor in their place, someone would be the bishop of that town. And so we have the initial bishops coming from the original apostles, all right? And so the, the apostles are, you know, going about the Roman Empire, and then you have the bishops who are left in place to take care of their flock in place. And as mortal men tend to do, they had the temerity to die. And so what they need to do was appoint successors to their posts. So someone had to take over for them when they died. And so you get the second generation of bishops. And they also died. And so they also had to set up more people. And so you can read about this process in the uh, letter to Titus, chapter 3, verse 9. Paul says to, uh, to Titus, I left you there so that you can lead people, and then when it's your time comes, you can appoint the successors. And so this kind of keeps on going, and if you follow this all the way up off the page, through the ceiling, and somewhere around the roof of this building, you will, in fact, find our Bishop Timothy. That's why we pray in the Mass for our Bishop Timothy. Uh, he is in this chart, if you were to follow it up high enough. But there's another thing that was done to instruct the people of God, which is the original apostles and their close confidants wrote down a lot of their teaching. It starts with four historical narrative biographies of Jesus called the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Two chronicles of the early church, what happened with the early church. One in a very literal way called the book of Acts. And the second one in a highly figurative sense called the book of Revelation. Not many people... Uh, actually know that about the book of Revelation, but there's a very strong case to be made that it's actually about the early church. And then after that, we have the epistles. This is the confusing part where you look at the top of the page and it's like Ephesians, Corinthians. And you're like, what is an Ephesian anyway? Well, the apostles, as I said, they were moseying about the Roman Empire, setting up a community, staying there for a couple years, moving on to the next place, right? And so every now and then, a letter would be sent from one of these communities that say, Paul set up in Corinth. And they would, he would get a letter saying, everything's on fire in Corinth. Everything's bad. You know, fix it. You know, write them a letter. Tell them what they're supposed to do. And so he would send out a letter to Corinth or Ephesus or Philippi. And he would give them instruction like, here's what you're supposed to be doing. Stop fighting. Stop getting drunk at mass. You know, stop, you know, sleeping with your stepmother. Um, uh, so that, yes, in the word of God. Um, so... Uh, so those are the sorts of things that get written in the pastoral letters. And there's a ton of those. So you get 13 from Paul, 3 from John, 2 from Peter, James, Jude, and Hebrews. And we don't know who even wrote Hebrews, which is what I love about it. It's so weird. All right, but that's not the end of the story. Uh, because it's not like the early Christians were waiting around with a checklist. And when they got all these letters together, um, they're like, great, New Testament over. Like, we now have the whole thing. Because this wasn't the only stuff ever written in the early church, and even by the associates of the apostles. We also have things like the letters of Ignatius, uh, who was the second, bit, uh, actually the third bishop of Antioch, after like Peter and then John. So he learned from John, and he wrote seven letters on his way to Rome to be killed by lions. Uh, then you have the letter of Clements, who would have known Peter. The Didache, which is also a very early teaching document in the martyrdom of Petra and Felicity. That's just a few examples of other things which are circulating in this time period. And there were Christian communities who actually thought this stuff was scripture. And, were, and they read it at Mass, at the liturgy. That's where you would hear these things read, was at the Mass, at the liturgy. And so different communities, you might go to a community, and they might be reading the letter of Clement on the same par as you know, the Gospel of Luke the same way that we read the, uh, the letters of, of Paul. And so if you're, you think about that, and you ask yourself, okay, oh, sorry. And there were also, at the same time, even until like the uh, three centuries after Jesus ascended into heaven, uh, there were other books like uh, Revelation and Second and Third John and Second Peter and James and Jude, which the Christians at the time still weren't all agreed about was whether or not they were scripture at all. So there would be some who would say, yeah, we don't think that Revelation should be in the Bible. And there's other who, others who would say, yeah, we don't even think that you know, 2nd and 3rd John is genuine, so we don't read those at Mass. And you think about this, and you're like, 
well then how did we get to this? How do we get from that to this? Where basically the whole world agreed that, yep, these 27 books, only these 27, not 26, not 28, exactly these 27 books, and only these 27 books, and we'll read these at the liturgy and we'll call these inspired. How did we get that table of contents? All right, and just to drive the point home, if it was up to me, um, I thought about wearing my I thought about wearing my khakis and my white t-shirt just so I would match. But um, anyway, so if it was up to me, uh, you know, if you just gave me all of these documents and just told me to fish out which ones I thought was inspired and I had nothing to go off of, I honestly probably wouldn't have included Paul's letter to Philemon, Third John, Jude, and I probably would have included uh, Ignatius and Clement just because. They, they strike me as being really good, and Philemon doesn't. Um, but at the same time, you're thinking, well, Steve, who are you to decide? You know, what? Who are you to decide what should be in the Bible anyways, right? Well, who is anybody to decide what should be in the Bible? So who had the authority to first discern the list, push down the stapler, and then bind it together as the New Testament? And this is where it goes back to these guys. So, the bishops all around the world, at the time, around the year 350, starting at the end of the 4th century AD, they start having little synods, little councils. One in Laodicea, near 350. One in Rome, in 382. One in Hippo, where everyone is hungry, hungry, in the year 392. <laughs> and in Carthage, in the year 397. At the conclusion of that, you had... A basically a universally accepted list of 27 books which everyone is going to agree uh, was going to be read in the liturgy and was going to be regarded as scripture. So what is the New Testament? The New Testament is the collection of 27 books which the 4th century Catholic bishops discerned were inspired by God and everybody, everybody who picks up the New Testament and believes that it is the inspired word of God is implicitly trusting in their discernment and their authority to decide that matter. That's true, even if they don't realize it. So, it's sort of like if you go to the gas station, it says on there, you know, this pump guaranteed by Indiana Weights and Measurements thing. Every time you pump the gas, you are trusting the Indiana Weights and Standards Measurement people did their job correctly. Every time you pick up the New Testament, you are trusting that those 4th century Catholic bishops did their job correctly. So that's an interesting fact. I mean, not many people know that, that that's where we got the New Testament from was a bunch of old Catholic duty pointy hats in the 4th century. Okay, let's talk about reading it. How do we read this thing now that we know where it came from? You can't read them all the same. You have to keep in mind genre. Genre. You go to the library and there's all kinds of different books uh, there. There's fiction books, there's history books. Well, that's the same way it is in the New Testament. So you have the Gospels and Acts, and those are written very similar. So what you're reading is a, is a narrative biography or a narrative historical accounts. It's not quite like that we read a normal book today, like a storybook today. It's not like the way we'd read a history book today. It's kind of a weird mixture of the two that we're not very used to. But what you want to do when you're reading these is to read it slowly and imagine yourself on scene. Think about the characters. Think about what they're thinking. What's their motivations? How might you have reacted in the same situation? So let me give you an example. The um, the blind man Bartimaeus who sits outside the walls of Jericho. You can get to Mass and they'll read that as, they'll say, as Jesus was passing by, there was a young man named Bartimaeus who was blind, and he called out, Son of David, have pity on me. And you're like, it's like, the, it's like it was written on cardboard. It was like the most boring thing ever. But if you think about what it was like to be blind Bartimaeus sitting outside the, the gates of Jericho, what happens when he hears this miracle work of Jesus coming to town? He goes out of his brain. That's what's happening in that, in that story. And so it says, like, the crowd rebuked him for calling out the name of Jesus. Well, imagine that guy going, Son of David, have pity on me! And he's stumbling over people, you know, and he accidentally touched this person on his hiney as he's trying to get to Jesus, and they're like, sit down, sit down! Like, and so you can, the crowd can come off, you know, in sort of a, they can come off like jerks, unless you imagine yourself on scene. You're like, well, geez, if I had this blind man, like, crawling up my back to get to Jesus, wouldn't I be like, just sit down, all right? Right? So the, the picture changes a lot when you imagine yourself on scene and imagine what people are really going through. Next thing to do is consider the words very carefully. Think about not what they mean to you, first things first. Don't imagine what they mean to you. Imagine what they meant to the original hearers at the time. That's what we call the literal sense of scripture. What it would have originally meant to the people there at the time. 
So there are various parables that Jesus tells that are really instructed for a Jewish audience. So the first thing you actually want to understand is what it meant to that Jewish audience. And then after that, you can look for the spiritual sense and apply it to you. Right? What does this mean in your life? You can also do this just to the event. So there's the, uh, the healing of the paralytic, where the, the friends of the paralytic bring the paralytic to Jesus, and then Jesus forgives his sins and uh, allows him to walk again. Well, the literal sense of the text is Jesus healed a paralytic and forgave his sins. But then there's also the spiritual sense where you say to yourself, how am I like that paralytic? How am I like a person who needs to have his sins forgiven and then healed so I can walk again? Or you can imagine yourself as the friends who brought him there. How am I like the friend who has to bring his paralyzed friend to Jesus? And then you can apply it to your own life. That's called the spiritual sense. One thing that I highly recommend is highlighting. I mean business about highlighting. And it's really good to have a system in place when you're highlighting. So, for instance, I like, you know, I go get one of these from the store. It has all the different uh, colors in it. And I do green for settings and times. So anywhere, anytime I open up the, the Gospels, I can look for the nearest green thing and I can know where Jesus was. So I just like to have a system. Okay, next let's oh, and start with Mark's Gospel. I always recommend starting with Mark's Gospel. People want to know, which one should I start with? Mark. Because it's the shortest, it's to the point. It doesn't spend a lot of time on the details. Uh, it's meant for an audience much like you know someone who's starting out. So start with Mark. Next, the pastoral letters. How do you read those? Well, one thing to keep in mind when you're reading the pastoral letters is you're reading a one-sided, one-sided phone conversation. So if you ever heard anyone talking on their phone and you're trying to figure out how this conversation is going, that's a bit like what it's like when you're reading the pastoral letters. So Paul will say something and you're like, what was he responding to when he said that? You know, what, what was brought up to him in the letter that got to him that no one kept that, he would, that would cause him to say this? So that's something to think about as you're reading them. It has specific issues it's supposed to be getting on about, so don't expect Paul to rehash all the details. Remember, he's writing to put out fires on an expensive piece of paper. Uh, he's talking to a scribe who he had to pay. So there's, some of these aren't even very long, but he's doing this to put out specific issues at the towns where he was preaching before. Another thing to keep in mind is definitely in the letters of Paul, he's building an argument, like a lawyer. Uh, their letter to the Romans is probably the hardest one. In the first 11 chapters is just one big argument that he is making for, you know, for quite a long period of time. So try to get the sense of what they're getting at in each passage. So for instance, in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, uh, it says, All who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Okay? And I've heard some people pluck that passage out of the Bible and they'll say, see, all you need to do to be saved is call upon the name of the Lord. So you don't need to change your life. You don't need to repent from your sins. You don't even need to believe for your entire life. You just have to, at some point in your life, call upon the name of the Lord and you'll be saved. And I, and I like to ask such people, like, what was Paul talking about in Romans chapter 10? What was the main thrust that he was getting at in that whole chapter of the Bible? Is that what he was trying to say when you put it in the whole context of that whole chapter? And people would look at me like, uh -huh. Like, yeah, you can't do that. Because in Romans chapter 10, he was talking about the universality of the gospel. He was talking about how you know, the, Jew, the, the Christians were driven out of Jerusalem and had to go preach to the whole world. And therefore, the, the, the gospel isn't just for Jews anymore, it's for everyone. Therefore, all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. So he's not saying that all you have to do in your entire life ever is just at some point call upon the name of the Lord. The point of that sentence was the emphasis was on the word all. So he's talking about how the gospel is for everyone. Right? And so if you want to know what, Jesus, what Paul had to say about repentance and all the rest of it, you've got to look elsewhere in the letter when he's actually talking about that. So that's just an example of, of trying to read for comprehension when you're reading these things. Um, and what I do is I read one paragraph at a time, starting at the beginning. I read it once, and then I reread it with highlighter in hand. And my goal is to make my own cliff notes. Highlight all the main points using the color that, of my choice, and my goal is to make it so that if I go back and read just the highlighted parts, I miss nothing. I get all of his main points that I can very quickly go in there and realize what Paul's talking about. And the others too, you know, Paul, John, all the rest of them. <laughs> Which one should you start with? The letter of St. James. That's the simplest one. It's not particularly long. It's, uh, it has a lot of very good stuff in there. That's the one I suggest is start with James. Okay. So, at the same time, you'll be reading these things and you'll have a question. You, you won't, not everything's going to make sense immediately. There are some people who will tell you that the Bible is perspicuous. That's a $3 word for, it means, it should, 
the assertion is that the Bible should make sense to everyone. The, anybody should be able to pick up the Bible, and all true Christians should be able to understand it perfectly on the first time. And those people are very silly, and you should not listen to a word they say, uh, because it is definitely okay to read the Bible and come away going, right? In fact, St. Peter, in his letter, he actually said, uh, he acknowledged that there are things in Paul's letters, specifically, which are hard to understand, and people can twist around if they're not instructed properly. So, don't feel bad if you're reading the Bible and you have questions. Rather, what you should do is you try to use some resources. I have to call this out the a written non-resource. Have you ever seen this New American Bible with the nice little scene on the front? I don't recommend that one. I, I, I used it for a long time, and I came to the conclusion that I just didn't want to use it no more. I didn't like the notes. The translation is kind of not all that great sometimes. Uh, and I, yeah, I didn't like using that one. What I do recommend is the Ignatius Catholic Study Bible, which has the same cover as the one that you guys just got, but uh, it's actually th this big, thick thing. It's got notes galore, and it's got maps and all kinds of fun stuff, and really good commentary. And, um, and so that's the one that I recommend, is getting this. Uh, that's the Bible that I would recommend to anyone to start with. Okay, other online resources, one would be the Catechism. Uh, the Catechism is technically a book, but it's just a lot easier to use Google. Just Google Catholic Catechism and then your topic, because the index in the Catechism is supernaturally bad. I'm pretty sure it was crafted by Satan or something. Uh, anything you look up in the index, is you're, you're just not going to find it. Um, all right, for commentaries, um, and again, this is all in your handout. There's the Thomas Aquinas commentary, that's free online. There's the Haydock Bible commentary, that's also free online. And those are the first two places I go when I when I have a question about a passage and I'm looking for some sort of feedback on it. Those are the first places I go. Also, BibleGateway.com is also very good for searching for keywords. So if you're looking for a specific phrase, you can go into BibleGateway.com uh, and look at that. Um, you can look at different translations. So I do a lot of work from there. And then if you want to see different translations at once, BibleHub.com is where you want to go. Um, but I have to give a warning that the commentaries there should be approached cautiously. Um, so some of them will say, like, if you're reading Revelation, they're like, the, you know, there's like one, it's like a Webb's commentary or something, it's down at the bottom of the page, and it's like, this passage about the devil is talking about the Pope, because the Pope is the devil, said that commentary. And I'm like, no, he ain't. Um, so anyways, and then personal resources. So you can, you can ask... You can ask uh, any of the priests, you can ask me or Lou. Um, you can also, one thing I do, if I'm totally stuck, I'll call up Catholic Answers Live on Tuesday or Thursday, and I'll talk to Jimmy Aiken or Tim Staples. That's my pal Jimmy Aiken. He's a really fun guy, uh, but not a mushroom. And so uh, those, are the, those are the resources I would use. And, you know, so the thing is, when you get stuck in a passage, when you get stuck in something, you have a question, don't think this question's never been asked before because, you know, it's been 2,000 years people have been wrestling with this stuff. I guarantee you someone's thought of it before. And usually there's a pretty satisfying answer out there. Might take some time uh, to get it, might take time to wrestle with it, but, you know, I've never been disappointed. Okay, how much time do we have left? Did I actually, like... Uh, ah, keep going. You've got a good two minutes. I got a good two minutes. No. Okay. My other activity I was going to try to do was to read John 9. Um, that's my favorite chapter of the Bible. Cat, would I, would, is, are people going to get mad at me if I try to do this? Go for it. Do it. Do it. Go, down. go for it. Okay. All right. So, so this is, go for it. All right. So, better to ask for forgiveness than permission. Um, this is no fun if you can't see the kitten. Um, you can't do it if you guys are talking about. So, um, all right. So, what I like to do with the Bible study is, is, you know, we'll we'll pick out a passage and then we'll read it and then we'll stop along the way and we'll talk about what's going on. So, this is John chapter nine, the healing of the man born blind. Now, as Jesus passed by. He saw a man who was blind from birth. His disciples said to him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents, that he was born blind. Jesus replied, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but the works of God should be revealed in him. I must do the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming, and no work can be done. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. All right, so there's something really important going on in that passage. There's, one common way to explain why bad things happen to good people is that they actually aren't good people. They're actually bad people, secretly. Right? So if something bad happens to a person, you go, what did he do to deserve that? 
right? Because we recoil at the problem of suffering, innocent suffering in the world. And we, we instinctively want it to be that person's fault so it can make sense again. And that's what the apostles are doing there. They're saying, who sinned that this man was born blind? And Jesus goes, nobody. Nobody sinned. This, was, this is allowed in the world so that I can work good out of it. And so why does God allow evil into the world? So that we can work something good out of it. So, alright. When he had said these things, he spat on the ground and made clay with his saliva. He anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay, and he said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. And so he, uh, so he went, and he washed, and he came back seeing. All right, so another question we can ask is, why did Jesus do that? Why did he just spit on the ground and make clay and then rub it in the man's eye? He could have just gone, eyes, right? So why did he, why did he bother making this physical thing and then sending him on his way and making him do something? Well, what you can see in this is a view of the sacraments. The sacraments involve matter and involve a miracle. So the sacrament of baptism, God works through water, right? Eucharist. God works through this thing that used to be bread. Also, another neat little thing here, it, it, in the text it actually translates it, it says, the, well, go wash the pool of Siloam, which means scent. That means that the original readers of this didn't know what Siloam meant. They didn't know Hebrew. So that means the letter, to, the letter, or rather, the Gospel of John was written to a non-Jewish audience. Um, therefore, the, na- uh, the neighbors and those who had previously had seen him blind said, is this not the man who had begged? And he said, I am he. They brought him to the Pharisees. Now it was the Sabbath when Jesus had made clay and opened his eyes. And the Pharisees asked him how he had received his sight. And the blind man said, Jesus put clay on my eyes. I washed and now I see. The Pharisees, uh, therefore some Pharisees said, This man is not of God because he doesn't keep the Sabbath. Others said, How could this man who is a sinner do such thing? And there was division among them. And the blind man said, or they said to the blind man, What do you have to say about this man? He said, I'm a, uh, he is a prophet. But the Sanhedrin did not believe him uh, that he had been blind from sight. Or, or, sorry. He did not believe him that he had been blind from birth until they called his parents. Uh, at this point, this is where I think, we oftentimes in imagery, we imagine this as a grown man. This is actually where I imagine him as a teenager. Because, you know, he's in trouble with the authorities and they call him his parents. All right, so I actually imagine this guy as high school age. Uh, and they asked the parents, is it your son, whom you say was blind? How does he see? And the parents say, we, we know that this is our son, he was born blind, but by what means he sees now, we do not know, or who opened his eyes. He is of age, ask him. He will speak for himself. His parents said these things because they were afraid of the Jews, for the Jews had agreed already that if anyone confessed Jesus as the Christ, they'd be put out of the synagogue. So, this is one that I reflect upon, because when I was growing up, um, my parents were not particularly enthusiastic about the Christian faith. It was sort of like an obligation that they did. And, um, you know, it was sort of like take it or leave it type thing. And so I reflect on this, that the, that the young man is far more fervent than his own parents. And that he has to be almost an example to his own parents. That's something I reflect on uh, when I was reading this. So they, they, again, they called the man who was blind. They said, give God the glory, for we know that this Jesus is a sinner. And he answered them, whether he's a sinner or not, I do not know. One thing I do know is I was blind and now I see. And they said to him, What did he do to you? How did, you open, how did he open your eyes? And he answered them, I have told you already, and you do not listen. What, do you want to hear it again? Do you, not, do you want to be one of his disciples? And so now he's flat out getting sarcastic with them. So that he knows these guys don't like Jesus. And he's like, do you want to be one of his disciples? You're asking a lot of questions about him. And they reply, they reviled him and said, You are his disciple, but we are Moses' disciples. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as for this fellow, we don't know where he came from. The, the, the man answered him, What a marvelous thing that you do not know where he came from, that he opened my eyes. We know that God does not hear sinners, and it, uh, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, he hears them. Since the beginning of the world, it has been unheard of that a man would have his eyes opened when he was blind from birth. If this man is not from God, he could do nothing. So at this point, you know, he has nothing to fear. He's like the Joker in the movie, uh, the, the, um, was it, The Dark Knight? What was the second one? The Dark Knight. The first okay, yeah, the second one, The Dark Knight. Uh, you know, he's like the Joker going, you have nothing to threaten me with. You hear that scene where Batman's you know, intimidating the Joker and beating him up? He's like, you have nothing to threaten me with. There's nothing you can do to me. That's, you know, this, his healing has made this man fearless. 
They answered him saying, you are complete. You are born in sin, and now you want to teach us? And they cast him out. Good comeback. Uh, Jesus heard that he had been cast out, and he had found the blind man. He said to him, do you believe in the Son of God? And he answered Jesus saying, who is he, Lord, that I might believe in him? And Jesus said to him, you have seen him. It is he who is talking to you. And Jesus, uh, then he said to Jesus, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. And Jesus said, For judgment I have come into the world, that those who do not see may see, and those who, um, and those who see may be made blind. Uh, then some of the Pharisees who uh, were with him heard him say these words and said, Are we blind also? And Jesus concluded, If you were blind, you would have no sin. But you say, We see. Therefore, your sin remains. And that's an important thing, because if we believe that we know everything, if we believe that we aren't blind, then we're responsible, we're more responsible. But if we have the humility to admit that we don't know everything, that we have the ability to learn, especially from God, then we can be humble, and we can become one of his disciples. And so that's what I hope you get out of this retreat this weekend, that's what I hope you get out of reading the scriptures, is that you are invited into a relationship of discipleship with our Lord, and that you will truly become one of his disciples. So, that's what I got.